Well, every few minutes, unfortunately, the death toll goes up at the upscale shopping mall in Kenya. As of just a few minutes ago, it was 68 dead in Kenyan mall assault. And when you read the news articles about it, it says the Al-Qaeda group that uh, took over the mall and held people hostage. Now, the Al-Qaeda group, uh, Israel is giving advice on how to counter that Al-Qaeda group. And I find that very frustrating because um, Israel currently is supporting and backing Al-Qaeda in Syria against Bashar Assad. And I'm going to show you that Reuters headline where one of their ministers said we back the Al-Qaeda bad guys over the Bashar bad guys. And my issue is that you don't start wars with a country with proxy soldiers and then call them the bad guys. This is extremely immoral. And what really makes me mad is that the Al-Qaeda threat will be used to take my liberties and your liberties. And that's why I'm here today. David Knight will be doing an hour and a half of the, of the two-hour broadcast. He's here, ready to go. Uh, but I got up this morning and was watching CNN and ABC News both uh, to monitor this. And on both channels, I've not found this in print, though. I tried to find it in print media today and could not do it. But on CNN and ABC News, I'm sure many of you saw it. If I saw it on both channels, I watched it. It must be everywhere as a talking point. That we better have checkpoints in, in malls here because Al-Qaeda is going to attack the shopping malls. Now, I've told you. In the last few years, I've seen pre-preparation programming for shopping malls to be shot up and then martial law to basically be rolled down the streets of America. It's like the, 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 the governor and a bunch of Congress people and state reps in Illinois are calling for troops on the streets permanently in Chicago. So again, they use crises to offer their solution. They take our guns, then there's so much crime that they have to come in and set up checkpoints all over Chicago. They fund Al-Qaeda, they allow Al-Qaeda to attack, then they get to take everyone's liberties because of the Al-Qaeda threat. It's very, very elementary, very, very simple to understand. It doesn't matter whether you're a politician in France, a politician in Germany, England, the United States, Canada, Israel, Norway, uh, or Kenya for that matter. You get to grab more power and take more liberty and silence more opposition when you've got shopping malls being taken over in 60 Eight people being killed. I'm sure the number will grow. They just got in there. They've, quote, freed most of them. The assault's ongoing right now. RT, I was watching it earlier, had live feeds of just the shootouts inside. They've got some ballsy reporters at RT. Uh, so pretty amazing, compelling stuff. Our hearts go out to all those that are being shot or injured or those that have lost loved ones over there. But I'm all about remembering what happened uh, in the past. I'm all about remembering what happened in the past and connecting it to what's happening currently and then what will happen in the future. We've got to remember that in the Obama deception that I put out now five years ago, five and a half years ago, we break down Obama and his connection to the radical Muslims in Kenya and to the prime minister at the time, Odinga, who Obama advised to stage riots all over the country so that when he lost the election for president, they would give him a new position of prime minister and manufacture that. And that is uh, what they indeed ended up doing for Obama, J just to give you an idea. And then tie it into how Obama specifically and certain elements of the New World Order are even making money personally off the takeover of North Africa Eastern Africa and the Middle East by the Saudi Arabian backed Al Qaeda groups. Remember, Obama bows to the king of Saudi Arabia. So it is truly, truly disgusting, and it's all coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the 22nd day of September 2013. We are going to be live here for the next two hours as we are every Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. Central, 5 to 7 Eastern, that's 2 to 4 Pacific, 3 to 5 Mountain. The news websites are InfoWars.com, PrisonPlanet.com, and InfoWarsNews.com. That's the InfoWars Nightly News. Again, thank you so much for joining us. I was not going to be here today. 
the very able, uh, one of the anchors and reporters and an and analyst for InfoWars Nightly News was going to be here, and he will be here at the bottom of the hour to cover a whole bunch of breaking reports, investigative journalism, a bunch of special reports that we're going to be premiering here on the radio. David Knight coming up on this Sunday edition because I have a wedding I'm scheduled to be at at uh, 530. Uh, so David Knight coming up. But I'm here because this is so important. And that's why I do a Sunday show because so much seems to break on the weekends, not just the weekday show. Live 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Central. Find showtimes, listings, free audio feeds, podcasts, so much more at InfoWars.com on the Listen tab. Watch tab as well. There's a free video feed up at InfoWars.com forward slash show. All right. Here we are, ladies and gentlemen, on this 22nd day of September 2013. And 68 people have died. And the gun battle is ongoing in Kenya Right now, in an upscale shopping mall, a major assault is underway late Sunday evening, their time, early Sunday evening here, as the uh, attack by paramilitary police aimed to take back an upscale shopping mall in Nairobi, Kenya, a day after Al-Qaeda-linked militants killed scores of people and took others hostage in an attack with grenades and assault rifles, authorities say. This will end tonight. Our forces will prevail, Kenya's Disaster Operations Center said. And it was 38, 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago. Now it's 68. So pray for those people. Now, I don't just one-dimensionally look at something like this. We have a lot of background on it. And we have pointed out that and predicted, I think even last Sunday, that we're going to see shopping mall shootings all over the world, all over the non-Muslim world, because the head of Al-Qaeda came out, in fact, print me this article, guys. The head of Al-Qaeda came out two weeks ago from Egypt and praised the U.S. helping fund Al-Qaeda to attack Bashar Assad in Syria, but said it didn't matter, we were still the main enemy attack America, attack Europe, attack Kenya, attack any non-Muslim country. He said, it's time to make them bleed. It's time to make them pay. He said, attack them, and he listed shopping malls. And so we came on air and we said, look for Al-Qaeda to attack shopping malls. It's not a hard equation here. And look for the government to say, we've got to lose our rights now and have no Fourth Amendment, and live in a police state because of, of Al-Qaeda, they are funding and supporting. And now they've hit the first target they can hit in the predominantly Christian Kenya. And you're going to see more of this, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to see more of this. And you're going to see the system now say, oh, we've got to take your rights. And I was watching ABC News this morning and CNN. That's why I came in today to do the Sunday show. And they both said, we need more mall security. Al-Qaeda is going to hit the malls. Our government has given billions of dollars in the last three years to the rebels out of Jordan, out of Iraq, out of Turkey and other areas. Israel is helping support Al-Qaeda. Their ministers are on record as of last week. I'm going to show you that article in a moment. This is blood boiling for me to see this happening. The entire West, from France to Germany, from Israel to the United States, Britain stepped back and said, we're not going to be part of this now. That ought to tell you something. They're usually at the very front of the line wanting to have wars. That's an old empire. They get, this is going to blow back, folks, and people are going to know the, the, the terrorist attacks, including aircraft that will be shot down, if, if they don't turn this around now, there are over 10,000 heat-seeking missiles missing since Benghazi. The ambassador wouldn't hand those over when the Turkish ambassador showed up and Obama ordered it, so that's okay. They just sent the Benghazi Al-Qaeda security force funded as the security. They keep saying, give us more funding for security. That was the security for the town. That's on record. And they went and killed the people there. That's why there's a cover-up. Because the State Department would, we're not going to give 10,000 heat seeking missiles to Al Qaeda. Really? One moment, please. The security gets pulled off the building. Here comes Al Qaeda. 
And that's where I wanted to go next with all of this, ladies and gentlemen. If you look at the news, and here's the article from WorldNet Daily uh, last month, evidence U.S. bribed Muslim Brotherhood officials. And it said Obama, through the State Department and CIA, Dr. Jerome Corsi, this is in the foreign press in the Middle East, is funding out of Kenya as the main source through Odinga and others, his cousin, are funding the overthrow of all these governments from Tunisia to Egypt to uh, Syria, Libya, you name it. And they've even in national television, state-run television in Egypt, are showing the State Department bribes of up to $800,000 per Al-Qaeda operative and to Muslim Brotherhood operatives to launch attacks and overthrow the government. Unbelievable. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen? That was from 8-24-13. Boom, here's another one. Obama's brother linked to Muslim Brotherhood running the money through other Muslim counterparts in Kenya as they attempt to overthrow Kenya. Now, by the way, I put this in the Obama deception five years ago. I'm not just showing you something from a month ago. I'm tortured by being informed. I'm tortured by uh, being aware. It's torture to see the public thinking, oh, that's Al-Qaeda attacking. Isn't that terrible? Take our rights while we keep us safe. When that's Al-Qaeda publicly funded by our government and others. Doesn't mean they run them. They fund them like a, like a wild pit bull that has rabies that you just release on some baby. But they bred it. They created it. They support it. They feed it. They feed it gunpowder to make it crazy. They are doing the whole nine yards, folks. And when you pull back and think about it, wow, they get to take over these countries, destabilize them, then have a war with Al-Qaeda later to sell more weapon systems for the Pentagon and others. And then they double back and take our liberties here. And here's that article I was mentioning. Uh, this is out of uh, Reuters. Israeli advisors helping Kenya in mall siege security source. Yeah, and then here's one from a week ago. In public shift, Israel calls for Assad's fall, says we've always wanted Bashir Assad to go. We always preferred the bad guys who weren't backed by Iran to the bad guys who were backed by Iran, said their minister, Orn. But does that mean then you fund the Al-Qaeda and give them ambulances and weapons in, in the Golan area to then go a start a fight with somebody just because you're not friends with them? That is very immoral, and Israel loses the high ground big time on like on things like that. And I don't like bashing any Western country, any country, period. But this is shameful, absolutely shameful to have this type of thing going on. And then Heretzk reports, more than 24 hours after Al-Qaeda linked attack, Islamicists, you know, kills 68. Come on, you can't have it both ways. We'll be right back. By the way, this is not too complex for the public to figure out. Adult males know all the football scores, all the baseball scores. Women know all the Hollywood stars. They know how much Brad Pitt weighs and how old he is. But you don't know about Kenya. You don't know about Al-Qaeda. What about Zawahiri, the head of Al-Qaeda, a week and a half ago, September 13th, leader of Syrian rebel group, calls for attacks inside U.S. and also just so happens to be head of Al-Qaeda and called for shopping mall attacks. He actually called for them from all over the world. And we come out here and say, hey, there's going to be attacks wherever they can hit, Middle East, Asia, Europe, they don't care. And when they hit us, they're going to say, now give your rights up. And no one's going to point out the entire West started a war with Syria almost three years ago and is ganging up, injecting al-Qaeda to attack them. I'm not a fan of Bashar Assad, even though compared to a lot of dictators, he's an angel. Just like Hazi Mubarak. I wasn't a fan of Hazi Mubarak, but he wasn't burning down all the churches in Egypt. And people had freedom, and I could visit there as a tourist. You can't go there now. They're dictators to keep these extremists under control. And I'm not saying that's a good system. But what's being put in is 10, 20, 30 times worse. Here's another one. Suicide attacks at church in Pakistan, New York Times, under orders of al-Qaeda. Boom. Week and a half ago, says start attacking. That, folks, it's starting. It's starting. And I'm telling you, they're doing this under orders from the West, from criminal elements of our government, to draw attention from the Dozens of scandals, but seven big ones. I told you this was coming before the head of Al-Qaeda did. Yeah, listeners can go back in the last few months. I've been saying, watch, it's going to start. Now, they think you're so dumb that I was watching ABC News this morning and CNN. 
And they were saying, they may hit our malls. We need to have TSA in them. We need to see when they're the ones, but not just funding Al-Qaeda in different countries or giving them the missiles from Benghazi a year ago. No, ladies and gentlemen, they're not just doing that. Specifically, the former prime minister who Obama told to have riots so he would be made the prime minister, Odinga, and Obama's half-brother are in the news last month funding radical Muslims for a big push in Kenya. And our guest, Dr. Jerome Corsi, formerly of the State Department, predicted this in Kenya. I'm trying to get him on tomorrow. I mean, whoa. This is so obvious and so slow motion. We can predict it before it happens. They may have Al-Qaeda to start blowing stuff up everywhere, ladies and gentlemen. They may attack shopping malls. And again, the people attacking will be real Al-Qaeda, but they won't know all the way up the line, the White House and groups above it punch the button for the distraction. Man, I tell you, I'm really freaked out right now. Now, continuing here, it's over 68 dead right now, and it continues to mount. This is such a tragedy. But here is a short clip. We covered it for like 30 minutes out of my two-hour film that came out in January, no, in February of... 2009, five years ago, with a political scientist Webster Tarpley talking about Odinga and the plan to destabilize Kenya using Al-Qaeda. Five years ago, boom, here it is. Obama basically does uh, a couple of things. One is, again, this idea, kick the Chinese out of Africa, kick them out of Sudan where they get oil, kick them out of Zimbabwe where they get raw materials, start a civil war in Congo, another big source of raw materials. Al-Qaeda, an arm of uh, the U.S. intelligence community, is now active in Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco. You've got a destabilization going on in Kenya around Odinga. That's Obama's cousin. This is a guy who has two uh, children. They're Obama's niece and, uh, well, nephew in a broad sense. Uh, and one of them is named Raul, and the other one is named Winnie, after Winnie Mandela, who did the necklacing and political assassinations in South Africa. So this... Odinga is essentially a CIA destabilizing operation in Kenya. All right, that's enough. He's got a... Let's stop there. We now have the documents where Obama's family is running the whole destabilization of Africa and the Middle East through his family in the hundreds of millions paying each commander of fighters as groups as small as 10, $800,000 a piece. This is, this is in the Middle Eastern news. You've got the uh, head ambassador from Russia from Saudi Arabia to Russia saying a month ago, we'll stage terror attacks inside your country using Al-Qaeda if you don't back off publicly. And then now Russia's warning Al-Qaeda may hit Russia. Folks, Al-Qaeda is used by the West. When we say the CIA, we mean criminal elements that have hijacked the CIA. And to be clear here, ladies and gentlemen, this is not our opinion now. This is public Public. I'll be covering it more tomorrow on the weekday show. We're going to break in a moment. David Knight, who was already scheduled to do the Sunday show, is here, but I came in because this is so important. I know he'll speak to it after the break and then get into his raft of news he's got to cover. But, I, but before we go to David, I want to play one more clip to remind you of how stupid the system thinks you are. These are not Americans. These are global crime syndicates running our government, running our military, running the intelligence agencies. They think you're so dumb they run al-Qaeda publicly. And they think you're so dumb, they tell you a debt limit increase is not increasing the national debt when that's exactly what it does. That's not even two plus two equals four. That is looking at the number one and saying that's a one. A two-year-old can do that. I mean, this isn't even two plus two equals four now, okay? This is the level of how dumb they think you are. And I don't think you're this dumb. Let's go to Obama saying the debt increase is not a debt increase. Raising the debt ceiling, which has done, been done over 100 times, does not increase our debt. It's what, 17 it trillion? Not, uh, somehow promote profligacy. All it does is it says you've got to pay the bills that you've already racked up, Congress. It, it, it's a basic function uh, of making sure that the full faith and credit of the United States is preserved. Use that big word, profligacy, but th that means wasting money. Oh, there's none of that going on. David and I, we're going to break in two minutes. First off, what is your take on, we've got to go back and find the clips where we predicted all of this just in the last month. Oh, yeah. With Corsi on. I mean, that's easy to find. We know what we're talking about. And these people are self-identifying themselves as Mujahideen. Now, we know where that started from, right? That is back pure Al-Qaeda. Afghanistan, yeah, that's back in Afghanistan. I mean, they changed their name to Al-Qaeda, but these guys are still the, the guys that were created by Reagan. And, and by Carter when they start arming them against the Soviets in Afghanistan. 
Yeah, it, it's exactly what we saw even going back to Operation Northwoods 50 years ago, right? They were talking about how at the time they were going to start a war with Cuba by flying uh, planes into buildings and by having gunmen attack malls. And they were going to blame it on the Cubans, even though it was going to be Americans who were flying these robot planes, you know, re remote control. And they were going to shoot up U.S. naval bases. Right. So if we don't understand... Oh, we forgot that. Shoot up naval bases. That's right. That's right. So if we don't understand, we don't remember the history, we're going to fall for these tactics and these techniques. And there's, there's, I've got documentation here going back 33 years from Michael Aquino, where he's talking about ELF extremely low frequency and how he can use that to drive people to do and of course that was a colonel head of psyops that's right, right. When, when when we come back you're going to have the floor i'll be out of here you can sit down and cover all this david knight for people to understand now with all this popping up this last shooting that looks very suspicious you're going to cover that at the naval yard this event other events it looks like they're activating sleeper cells and other groups. Yeah. And and if they can't get Al Qaeda to attack because the security's too good by the grassroots, they're going to just have mind control agents act as patsies, basically. Absolutely. That's the technique. That's what they said they were going to do. We ought to believe them. All right, folks. When we come back, David Mind will be sitting right here uh, in the main broadcast chair, and I'll be back tomorrow, 11 a.m. Central, with the weekday show, InfoWars.com. David's got a lot coming up, so please stay with him and tell your friends and family tune in right now. This is Key Information. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, filling in for Alex. He's heading off to a wedding today. So I'm here. I, I come in when he does weddings and funerals. Otherwise, Alex is working 24-7. He really is. He's, he's on this, as you just heard. He's right on top of what's happening in Kenya. The implications of how that's going to be used to take away our freedoms, to push the security state, the surveillance state, even farther into our lives. They've been talking about this for a long time. Now they've got what they think is a justification. But remember that things had kind of gone silent on gun control for a while. And it was just a week ago that Obama went on the Stephanopoulos show and talked about gun control. Stephanopoulos asked him about its failure, and Obama lied. He said... Well, 90% of the public believed in that. That's absolutely not true. I think he was getting that confused with the, he didn't cite a source on that, actually. There is a source on our poll that says 91% of the people did not agree and did not want to go to war with Syria on that issue. He was in the 90% on the wrong side. Now he's saying that 90% of the people, he said last week, 90% of the people were with him. And then, of course, the next day, interestingly enough, we had a shooting the day after that. We had Piers Morgan with his propaganda show and Rick Warren as a pastor response team, clergy response team. He was uh, right there, Johnny on the spot, to help with that argument. And now we see other incidences that they're using all happening in very quick succession. And we're going to talk about if it's just a coincidence, if it's just synchronicity, or if maybe there's something else to that. But Jakari Jackson had an interesting report this week about, is it really 90% approval for gun control? Let's take a look that I'm Jakari Jackson with an InfoWars news alert. The article in InfoWars.com reads, Less than half of Americans want stricter gun laws. In a poll conducted by Gallup, 49% said gun laws should be more strict, with 13% saying they should be less strict. Those numbers have starkly changed from just nine months ago. Perhaps this is due to Chicago, with some of the strictest gun laws in the country being deemed the murder capital of America. I've been to numerous gun rallies, both for and against stricter gun control, and I find that the majority of passers-by are either content with the current gun laws or just impartial one way or the other. You see these guys walking around with their firearms, right? Does that alarm you in any sense? Not at all. Not at all? So you see, you see these guys, they got a, one guy's got an AK, one guy looks like an AR over there, and that doesn't bother you one bit? Not at all. You can see this guy, you know, he has a, you know, a big gun over there. And does that, does that bother you at all? Does that make you feel scared? Oh, no. No? No, no not at all. <laughs> Chilling out. Yeah, see, he's feeling good. You feeling safe? You see this guy? Oh, you said, oh, it does make you feel safe. Hey, does it bother you at all if these guys are out here with their guns? Hell no. No, it doesn't bother me at all. Not one bit? Not one bit. <laughs> Excuse me, man, does it bother you these guys are out here with their guns? With their guns? Yeah, you, look, look, the guy, turn around. Let, let me see your gun. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit? But you see you got the troopers over there to protect you, right? <laughs> they have guns, too. Yeah. Guns freak me out. So what do you think about all these guns out here? I don't know, man. Don't know? All right, that's good, guys. What do you guys think about all these guns out Let's here? Let's pull that down here. Yeah, there you go. That's a, that's a non-scientific poll that Jakari did, talking to people on the street. But as he pointed out, it's not 90% of the people in any poll, in any scientific poll. Now, we pointed out that Reuters said 90% of the people were against Obama and Syria. But that, was, that report was done just before the shooting on Saturday. And 
it was it broke at the end of the week that Chicago already was the murder capital of the United States. And then we had that shooting on Saturday. And this is what Obama said in response to it. Again, look at the facts that he's putting out here. Just as factual as his 90% support of gun control. He says, it's happening every single day. No, it's not. And he says, we fought the good fight earlier this year, but we came up short. And that means we've got to get back and go back at it. Because as long as there are those who fight to make it as easy as possible for dangerous people to get their hands on a gun, then we've got to work as hard as possible for the sake of our children. It's always about the children, isn't it? Are we working to get, the, get guns in the hands of dangerous people? No. These are people that Obama thinks are dangerous because they don't work for him necessarily. But, you know, he doesn't even trust the military. They disarmed most of the people in the military bases, except for the MPs. Soldiers are not allowed to carry firearms. These are people who are trained in the use of firearms. These are people we depend on for the defense of our country. And he doesn't allow people in military bases like the Navy Yard to have firearms for their own protection. These things are always happening, as Larry Pratt pointed out, they're always happening in the gun-free zones. These are the places where they've got the most stringent gun control laws. It's in Washington where the Naval Yard shooting took place. There, they even had a Supreme Court decision that the city lost, and they still ignored the Supreme Court as well as the Constitution. In Heller versus D.C., it was an off-duty police officer who was trying to get permission to carry his firearm off-duty. This is a guy that they can't trust as long as he's not on duty. Isn't it amazing? That's the kind of environment that allows these things to happen. But these are the things that they're not talking about. They're not talking about bogus homeland security. If they can't keep people safe in a military facility, then how are they going to keep us safe at the malls or anywhere else? It's going to just be nothing but harassment. And the violent crime that is happening in Chicago, I've talked many times to Jim Girock, who's with Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. That's an organization of mostly former policemen, prosecutors, judges who have all come out against the war on drugs, basically prohibition in general. They're not saying that they haven't turned into Timothy Leary. They're not saying that uh, you know, they've now turned on and, and uh, tuned out or dropped out. They understand the dynamics of prohibition. In the case of Jim Girak, he was a prosecutor in Chicago, in Cook County, for many decades. He was there before the war on drugs. He saw what happened as the war on drugs geared up under Reagan, where they had zero tolerance, where they had mandatory minimums. He saw these things happening, and he understood that what it did was simply to create corruption and to breed gang violence, and it made the drug, worse, the drug use much more pervasive, much more widespread. It created a violence between gangs. That is what is, is at the bottom of this shooting in Chicago. They even mentioned uh, the names of the gangs in the, uh, in the uh, article. And as he pointed out, 80%, 80% of the shootings in Chicago were between gang members. They were drug-related. They weren't people just randomly killing other people. It was drug-related. Can't we learn the lesson of prohibition from alcohol prohibition? It was only during alcohol prohibition that we had guys hanging off the running boards, the Model Ts, shooting up the town with machine guns, shooting up each other and a lot of innocent bystanders. The same thing is happening now in Chicago, but it's gotten worse. The other thing that happens with prohibition in both alcohol and in the case of drugs is that the source itself gets far more concentrated, far more dangerous. So in both alcohol prohibition and in drug prohibition, they've created new and more dangerous forms of the drugs. So even from that standpoint, it doesn't work. But it breeds crime. It breeds corruption in government. Why is it that we can have people overdose in federal prisons from drugs? It's because interdiction doesn't work. It can always be gone around by corruption. And I tell you, if they get the kind of prohibition that they want out of firearms, we're going to see an amazing innovation in firearm technology. And we're going to see people shooting each other up in the street as they compete over turf to supply firearms. And I can tell you that firearms are going to be in big demand at that point in time. It's going to turn the whole country into something that's worse than Chicago or worse than Washington. They like to say that it's because of these other jurisdictions that are close to them that these firearms are coming in. But you have to ask yourself, why are the crime rates in these neighboring jurisdictions where they have such easy access to firearms, why is the crime rate there so much lower than it is in these areas where no one is armed? 
where no one is able to fire back. It's because you have to wait for one or two people. You're, you're dependent on one or two people who are security guards. Those people can be taken out early, as what has happened in the Naval Yard. Then you have to wait for responders to come. And then you have situations that we saw in the Naval Yard where they told the SWAT team to stand down. That is very suspicious. And the most suspicious thing, most of the time we're told that there's multiple shooters and these other shooters all disappear and then we fall back always to the lone shooter who nobody hears from because he's shot and killed. And of course, Aaron Alexis was shot and killed, but he did leave us a message. He left us a message from the grave. And we're gonna talk about that right after the break. When he wrote on the stock of his shotgun, not his AR-15, my ELF weapon. We're going to talk about what that means right after the break, so stay tuned. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, filling in for Alex. Now, just before the break, we were talking about, of course, this shooting that's going on in Kenya and how the corporate media is trying to spin that to say that we're going to need to have Homeland Security get all over us at the shopping malls. They've been dropping hints about that for quite a long time. Now they're talking openly about it, repetitively about it. I find it very interesting that just on September 17th, last Tuesday, as everybody was preoccupied with a naval shooting, Obama quietly got rid of a couple of laws by executive order that prohibited the arming of terrorists. This is in the Examiner, the Washington Examiner, and this is back on September the 17th. And in it, he reported, the president, citing his authority under the Arms Export Control Act, announced today, that was last Tuesday, that he would, quote, waive the prohibitions in Section 40 and 40A of the AECA related to such a transaction. In other words, arming radical Islamic terrorist groups. So obviously they're not that worried as they seem to pretend that they are. They're not that worried about terrorists if they're going to continue to arm them in Syria and elsewhere. But while they arm the terrorists in Syria, while they do that, they're telling us that they still have to stick their hands down our pants. And now they're going to get on us at the mall. Well, this is all, in my opinion, something that is, is, is rolling out as a controlled operation. If you look at what happened with the shooter, it always comes out that these guys are on a drug, an SSRI. In this case, it was trazodone that he was on. But we also have something else that was very interesting I mentioned just before we went to the break. He wrote on his, the stock of his gun, and it was not an AR-15, as the New York Times and Piers Morgan kept reporting all through the week, long after everybody knew better. He went in, he got a single shotgun. He did pick up a pistol off of one of the officers that he shot because he went for the few people that had the guns. He took them out first, and then it was a shooting gallery. But he had written on the stock of his gun, better off this way, my elf weapon which is actually ELF, that's extremely low frequency, just like in the days we had analog television, it was VHF, UHF, this is extremely low frequencies. Now, this is something that has a connection to mind control going back a long time. And I wanna read you something from an organization, this is a, a paper that was put out in 1992. And this is from an organization called uh, the Electronic Surveillance Project, it's the Association of National Security Alumni. And they wrote on here, covert actions are counterproductive and damaging in the national interest of the United States. They're inimical to the operation of an effective national intelligence system, and they corrupt civil liberties, including the functioning of the judiciary and a free press. Isn't that what we've seen now? They say, most importantly, they contradict the principles of democracy, of national self-determination, international law to which the United States has publicly committed. You know, we're seeing a pushback against all these NSA spying and everything. We see that Brazil refused to meet with President Obama after they learned that the U.S. was spying on them. And just in the last couple of days, Brazil has come out and said that they're working on a second Internet, a worldwide Internet, part of the BRICS. That's Brazil and China, the Soviet Union, India. These are the growing countries of the world, a major, major economic bloc. And they're coming up with their own Internet system in response to the corruption that they see and our internet system. Understand that the internet was initially created by DARPA. I used to laugh that they had hoisted themselves by their own petard. As I look at it now, I kind of wonder if the entire internet wasn't a systemic Trojan horse, just like Google and Facebook. Maybe they put this thing out there to get everybody on it just so it would make it easier for them to spy on us. Do you think? I think that they're certainly capable of doing something like that. But let's look at what this person wrote about. They were writing about mind control experimentation, and they were writing about the fact that 
you could beam these uh, energy weapons at people and cause them to be harassed, which is exactly what we saw Aaron Alexis complaining about before this happened. And listen to what they said. We frankly find it curious that more attention and credibility is being accorded to purported victims of UFO experiences and spectral visitations than to persons who complain of systematic harassment and experimentation by the U.S. government involving technologies which the U.S. government is only now grudgingly admitting to possess. And, of course, that was 20 years ago. We now know the name of a lot of these different systems. We have one from DARPA that's called the Sonic Projector that was mentioned in mainstream press back in 2007. The Army has something called Voice to Skull. That was put out in, in 2008. We know the Air Force is using microwaves to create sounds. That was research conducted at Brooks Air Force Base. We know the Marine Corps had something called the Medusa Project that was talked about in the Washington Post in 2005. They also mentioned in that same article from the Washington Post that the State Department was working on something. We also know that American Technologies had patented something called Hypersound, which does the same sort of things that Aaron Alexis was complaining about. And we know that Holosonic Research Labs has also patented a version of this. We even had situations just a couple of years ago where A&E, in order to promote their supernatural uh, paranormal series, they had a billboard in New York City where they would beam sound into your head. They were using microwave, and you could not pick it up unless you were in that cone where they were hitting you with the microwave. These are technologies that the government has been working on for decades. These are things that the KGB was working on to harass people. In this paper that was written in the 90s, listen to what he says about the KGB and ask yourself if it doesn't sound like our government today. He said the KGB's successes depended on the extensive use of informant networks and agent provocateurs and following Brezhnev's rise to power on the use of drugs and psychiatrists for further purposes of manipulation and control. Shadowing, bugging, slandering, blacklisting, other related tactics were also cited as serving KGB purposes. And participants in the conference agreed that the KGB's obvious intent was to divide and isolate the populace, to spread fear, to silence dissenters. See, the KGB mentality, as he points out, is exactly what we're seeing with the CIA. And he was writing this again 21 years ago. But it was actually even longer than that. We had a very good article by someone named Michael Aquino. And actually, it wasn't an article. It was an entire study, a book called Mind War. And um, you need to familiarize yourself with this if you haven't. And as a very good friend of mine pointed out, there's a direct connection between Aquino's mind war and what happened at the Navy shooting yard. Listen to what he says. Existing PSYOP identifies purely sociological factors which suggest appropriate idioms for messages. And he says this is always developed and we want to convert people to this. But he said there are some purely natural conditions under which minds may become more or less receptive to ideas. And mind war should take full advantage of them. And what he talks about is atmospheric electromagnetic activity, air ionization, and extremely low frequency waves, ELF, exactly what Aaron uh, Alexis wrote on the stock of his gun. And he talks in the footnote, he explains what ELF is. He says ELF waves are up to 100 hertz, once more naturally occurring, but they can also be produced artificially, such as in the Navy's Project Sanguine for submarine communication. That's where Aaron Alexis attacked. He said ELF waves are not normally noticed by the unaided senses, yet their resonant effect on the human body has been connected to both physiological disorders and emotional distortion. Infrasound vibration can subliminally influence brain activity to align itself to wave patterns, delta, theta, alpha, or beta wave patterns, inclining an audience towards everything from alertness to passivity. This is a situation where he's talking about using the mind and using these kind of covert techniques to pacify a population. He had said earlier in it that he said the goal is not to try to win people by an intellectual argument. The goal is simply to get them to accept it passively. And he would use any means to do that. One of the means would be these kind of technological means. Another mean, means, and that is what we're seeing all the time, is to get people to understand that it's the very source that makes something credible. You know, we look at these types of things, I almost feel sometimes like I'm in one of these science fiction or horror films where something really strange happens. Some alien lands and somebody sees this and they're trying to convince people and it is just so far out of what they're willing to accept that nobody will listen until the problem gets really huge. Well, now it is really huge. Now they're not really trying to cover it up anymore. This is something that's been an open secret for decades.
And we were going to have a report right after the break. I'm, it's not enough time to go into the report right now, but we had a doctor who came by and gave us his firsthand experiences. He's written a book on it. We did an interview with him. Alex talked to him last Thursday. I also interviewed him. We put all this together. I want you to hear this report. And you need to understand that there are things that are going on that, that people have been leaking for quite some time in the mainstream press. And it's becoming more and more open. And now we see, and what this guy wrote on the stock of his gun, it was his suicide note. And he was telling us exactly what was happening. He had been hearing voices. The first thing he did was he went to the police. But of course, in this type of harassment, in this type of covert operation, they know that you're going to be perceived as being a schizophrenic. And we're going to talk right after the break. What is the difference between schizophrenia and psyops? How do they manifest themselves differently when somebody is being deliberately targeted for this kind of mind control operation, for this kind of harassment, to push somebody over the edge, to push them to consume drugs in massive quantities that are known, known to have suicidal, violent outcomes. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex. Now, just before the break, we were talking about what happened at the Navy Yard. Aaron Alexis carving into the stock of his gun his suicide note, better off this way, and my ELF weapon. Why would he go to the Navy Yard? Well, that happens to be a center of activity with ELF. This is something that you can't shield yourself from. You know, we're, we're, we have the stereotype of the conspiracy theorist with the tinfoil. Well, you know what? Tinfoil doesn't work against ELF. Nothing blocks it. That's why the Navy uses it to communicate with submarines worldwide. So you can't block this, but it is something that technologically they've been working on for a very long time, as I mentioned just before the break, for decades. You've got DARPA, you've got the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, the State Department, you've got private industry using it. You've even got billboards. This uh, case, the billboard, it was the title of this article back in 2007 was Schizophrenia is the New Ad Gimmick. It's just like people complain about schizophrenia, hearing voices in their head, and yet it is something that is planted there technologically. It is possible to do it. But a lot of people refuse to believe that the government is morally capable of, of something like that. And I have to point out that the person who wrote this article, Mind War, is Michael Aquino. Now let me introduce Michael Aquino to you if you don't know who he is. This is a guy who is a Satanist. He was a follower of Anton LaVey in the Church of Satan. Then he split off and formed his own church, Temple of Set. Set being another name for Saturn or Satan, according to the occultist. He also was alleged to have been part of a child molestation ring at the Presidio. A large settlement was paid to parents and families, and he was moved by the army. You can see video of him on YouTube on Oprah Winfrey's show, where he's confronted by a member of the studio audience about a ritualized murder. This is a guy who looks like a cross between Eddie Munster and, and Spock. I mean, th this is a seriously disturbed, in my opinion, individual, a very dark individual. And yet he's one of the key guys at the NSA while he was there. He's now retired. While he was there, he wrote this article, Mind War. And in it, he's talking about the difference between propaganda and psychological operations and what he wants to achieve, what he wants the NSA, the CIA and DARPA to achieve against us. And that is, he doesn't, he says uh, propaganda works only to the extent that an enemy is willing to do what we want him to do. I'm sorry, propaganda is what they want people to do when they, they make an argument, an intellectual argument to them. But what he wants to do with mind war is to get people to do this without even a mental assent. In other words, it truly is mind control. It's not persuasion and it's not propaganda. He makes a clear distinction between those two things. It's simply getting people to do whatever he wants them to do. So what we had in the case of the shooter was it was portrayed in the press as here was somebody who was terribly disturbed. How could he have gotten a firearm? Because he's hearing voices in his head. He's obviously schizophrenic. And yet if you look at the timeline, it was August the 7th that he first had issues of voices in his head. A very sudden onset, very late in life for someone who's schizophrenic. And again, schizophrenia itself is a very rare disease. Only 1% of the population has it. And he has a sudden onset and he goes to the police and he's talking about not God talking to him, not Satan talking to him. He's talking about multiple people. He says they're harassing him. He says they're using microwaves. He knows 
perhaps something about this because he was an electronics technician. So he believed that he was being harassed. He moved hotels several different times. He went to the police. And of course, when the government is doing this to you, one of the things that makes it work so well is that if you go to someone, they think immediately that you're schizophrenic, that you're crazy. People just can't believe that the government would do these types of things to people. And yet we have people who are Satanist, who are basically in the highest levels of the NSA. So it's certainly something that they're morally capable of. And it's something that we need to think about. Here's DARPA. Look at the types of projects that they're putting together. Look at the fact that they've got a budget that is the size of North Korea. They've got a budget that is $2.8 billion. North Korea's entire budget for everything, not just military spending, is $3.2 billion. So we've got 140 people who are working on dark projects that are targeted towards controlling the population. Welcome back to The Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, filling in for Alex. Now, we've been talking the last couple of segments about mind control. We've been talking about Aaron Alexis writing on the stock of his gun, my ELF weapon. I think it's very important that we understand that we need to get the public to wake up to the techniques that the government is using. It was after the Boston bombing that people began to wake up to the long established technique of false flags, a long history of that. And yet it was something that up until that point, up until Dan Bedondi went to the press conference and brought that up and people started asking, well, false flag, what is that? Then they started looking at the history of how it's been used, not only by our government, but many governments. It's a favorite tactic to deceive the population, to manipulate the population into doing something. But they have much more subtle, more covert, more technological means to manipulate people. And perhaps the message from the grave that was on the stock of Aaron Alexis, my ELF weapon, perhaps that is going to be something that finally wakes people up to what's going on with some of these dark scientific projects. You know, it was Eisenhower who warned us in his military industrial complex speech. It was actually his farewell address. And he warned us about the military industrial complex. But he also warned us about a scientific research and discovery and how we should be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. Now, who might that be? Do we have a situation like that? As I mentioned just before the break, DARPA, the Defense Research Project, has essentially a dark budget, but they have $2.8 billion. And to put that in perspective, the entire budget for everything in North Korea, the North Korean government's entire spending is $3.2 billion. So this is huge. Just like we have a Defense Department that spends more than all the rest of the other countries combined. We also have this department here that is working on advanced projects. And look at the type of research that they're funding. They're funding robots that can run faster than humans, super strong robots. They're even talking about having robots that are autonomous, that are making their own decisions. And of course, that would be basically putting them into an urban environment and they would be killing everyone, everyone except perhaps personnel that had a tag on it saying that I'm with uh, the U.S. government or whatever. These are the types of weapons of mass destruction that they're working on. And they're working on these robots because they frankly don't believe they can trust humans to follow the chain of command to do some of the things that they want them to do. So certainly they could uh, get a robot to do that. But it's not just weapons of mass destruction. I mean, we look at the potential of these robots that are under the control of one or two people. All you need to have is a corrupt megalomaniac get in charge. And we've also already seen that we've got people very high up in the NSA who are Satanists. Uh, so, and we've got people who are lying to the public openly and committing perjury about what the NSA is doing. Nothing happens to them. The potential for corruption is not even any more potential. It's already a reality. We should be very concerned about the fact that power is being concentrated and this kind of military firepower is being concentrated more and more into a more concentrated group. But just look at the budget that DARPA has. It's $2.8 billion. You talk about a scientific technological elite. This is only about 140 people that are, it's 240 personnel altogether, but only 140 of them are really making the technological decisions. The rest would be support staff. They are making these kinds of decisions and the stuff that they're working on, these what they call non-lethal weapons, are really weapons of mass control. You know, they talk about weapons of mass destruction. These are weapons of mass control. They're looking to propagandize and take over a population. And it's a multi-front war. They're already 
remove the prohibitions for having Voice of America send radio waves into America. This is, that was set up as a propaganda organization after the, at the beginning of the Cold War, and they prohibited them from operating in the United States. They've just removed that recently. So now they're going to be hitting us with that kind of propaganda. At the same time, they're working on mind control techniques. And we've also been warned about these types of mind control capabilities, about being able to beam this information in, it can even work over power lines, especially over smart meters. There's a lot here that people really need to wake up and look at. Perhaps they'll understand if they look at what he meant by my ELF weapon. We've got a special report on that right now. Let's run that. Navy Yard shooting some strange evidence is turning up. Just before the shooting, Aaron Alexis purchased a shotgun. Not an AR-15, as Piers Morgan keeps telling people. But he purchased a shotgun, and he carved into the stock my elf weapon they mentioned it as cryptic etching that said my elf weapon well it wasn't cryptic to him he's worked in this field so he knew exactly what he was being targeted with the voices he was hearing didn't tell him to go run amok at the navy yard he went to where he perceived the the weapons coming from a lot of information is now surfacing about voices in his head and the new york times and other corporate media are painting a picture of someone who was insane but slipped through the screening process. But let's look at the timeline. Alexis was hired by the military subcontractor back in September 2012. On August 7th, the first incident of him reporting voices in his head was filed as a police report in Rhode Island. Then on August the 23rd, he goes to the VA emergency room in Rhode Island for sleeping pills. Those sleeping pills were trazodone. Five days later, August 28th, he goes to a VA emergency room in Washington, D.C. for more sleeping pills. Just five days later, is he using them very heavily? Trazodone has been shown to have side effects of suicidal tendencies, panic attacks, depersonalization, and anger. The timeline shows that the first time Alexis heard voices in his head was August the 7th. So the question isn't just why or how he slipped through the screening process, but why the sudden onset of voices in his head. You know, you can't discount mental illness, you know, especially being a physician, you've got to recognize that schizophrenics exist. For one, he's a little old to just all of a sudden go schizophrenic. Typically, Bingo. Yeah, typically. That's 34? Typically, it's like in your teens. 18 to 28. Yeah, 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 typically. Army has something they call voice to skull. We've got the Air Force using microwaves to create sounds at Brooks Air Force Base. We've got the Marine Corps with their Medusa project. We've got the State Department, as reported by the Washington Post in 2005, working on voices implanted in people's heads. So the military-industrial complex has been all over this. When you see something this wide, this is not just one little research project from one organization. Mm -hmm. Voice of God weapon, which is actually called S-Quad, or Silent Sound Spread Spectrum, was used in the first Operation Desert Storm. Let's go back to the August 7th report. There was a verbal altercation with an unknown party at the airport. He believes the individual that he got into an argument with had sent three people to follow him and kept him awake by talking to him and sending vibrations into his body. He said he first heard them talking to him through a wall while at the residence end in Middleton, then packed up and went to a hotel on the Navy base where he heard the same voices talking to him through the walls, floors, and ceiling. Then he moved to a third hotel and was currently at the Marriott. He said three individuals are speaking to him through the floor. He said the same individuals are using some sort of microwave machine to send vibrations to the ceiling, penetrating his body so he can't sleep. He said he never felt anything like this, and he's worried that the individuals are going to harm him. The on-duty sergeant reviewed the report, and because it was a naval-based connection, reported the incident to the naval station police and faxed a copy to them they said they would follow up. What was revealed today by the New York Times is that the defense contractor contacted the hotel about his behavior. So both the Navy and the defense contractor knew about the voices in his head on August 7th, about five weeks before the shooting. And we know that a SWAT team was in place at the time of the shooting and told to stand down. Were the voices schizophrenia or a PSYOP? Being a medical doctor, I don't want to come across as everybody hearing voices is mm -hmm. being victimized by technology. Certainly schizophrenia exists. For one, schizophrenia is not quite as common uh, I think as the press has led people to believe. It, it's still severe schizophrenia, is still a relatively rare disorder. Um, most of the victims that I've worked with can pinpoint the day that they started hearing voices and the day that they noticed organized stalking, people following them around. Typically schizophrenics are identified from 18 years old to 28 years old, maybe a little later in females, 
um, but almost always at a young age. If you talk to schizophrenics about what they're hearing, typically it's, it's God or angels or deities uh, or garbled voices like you hear in a, in a subway. Mm -hmm. The people that are being victimized by this technology are hearing the voices of people that are obviously watching them. Oftentimes they'll know the names of these voices because it's a two-way communication system. Mm -hmm. So they're hearing the people doing the surveillance talk to each other as well as talk to them. Uh, typically it's uh, their whereabouts in a room is being described. All right, so you can see the rest of that report on Alex Jones' YouTube channel. That is uh, mind control or schizophrenia, actually. Schizophrenia or psyops is what we call it. Now, if you want to call in, we're going to talk about this and some other issues at 877. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex, and we've been talking about what's happening in Kenya and what our government is trying to do in the wake in terms of using that as an excuse to try to get the TSA actively involved at now shopping malls. We see that as a talking point now all over the media. And you can expect to see that ramp up this next week. They've been talking about it for a while. This is their incident to seize on because something happened in Kenya where, as Alex pointed out, Obama's got a lot of connections, a lot of high connections in the Kenyan government. And he's got a lot of connections with Al-Qaeda, or as they call themselves, the Mujahideen. Remember the Mujahideen? These are the people that the Carter administration, the Reagan administration, armed in their fight against the Russians, the people that turned into Al-Qaeda. And as we pointed out earlier, Obama, on Tuesday after the shooting on Monday, waived the ban on arming terrorists to allow aid to Syrian opposition rebels. So he's prevented by law from aiding these terrorists, and he just says, uh, that doesn't apply now. We're going to give them weapons. If you want to call in and talk about this, or if you want to call in and talk about what you think about the Naval Yard shooting, our toll-free number on Sundays is 877-789-2539. That's 877-789-2539. Call and let us know what you think. Now, Obama's got his war on Syria, and he's also got his war on coal. You remember when he was running the first time back in 2008, he had this to say? Presented whatever power plants that are being built, that they would have to meet the, the rigors of that market and, and the ratcheted down uh, caps that are placed, uh, imposed every year. So if somebody wants to build a coal power plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that uh, greenhouse gas that's being emitted. That will also generate billions of dollars that we can invest in solar, wind, biodiesel, and other alternative uh, energy approaches. The, the only that's thing good. that I've said... That's good. All we need to know to is... I haven't been some coal booster. All we need to know is that he's going to bankrupt you if you invest in a coal plant. And now he's making good on that. Also this last week, while everybody was talking about the naval shooting, he pushed his war on coal. Coal producers, utilities, Republicans, and Democrats in Congress all say that new pollution standards announced Friday would effectively outlaw, outlaw the construction of new coal-fired power plants and raise prices for electricity and cost jobs. It'll impose the first cap on carbon emissions from new power plants and deals a blow to the market for carbon, for coal rather. So this is the scheme, it's been the scheme all along. They're going to try to drive everybody into a carbon credit situation. This is gonna be essentially the, think about the Federal Reserve on a worldwide basis. That's what these carbon credits are going to amount to. We're going to pay them for the privilege of using energy. That's right, just like we pay the Federal Reserve for the privilege of money that they print uh, they're, we're going to now have to pay somebody like Al Gore, somebody that runs some carbon credit exchange. I don't know why we should have to pay them, but they're go we're going to have to pay them almost like it was some kind of a religious, uh, uh, kind of a, a indulgence, like back in the Middle Ages, where we get uh, the capability to uh, to go sin. You know, it's kind of a way of relieving yourself of that. Now, the renewables that he's talking about are great, and they work really well. On an individual basis, when you look at solar, even wind on an individual basis can be a very effective way to get off the grid. And that's a, really what a lot of people should be trying to do is to get off the grid, not only for your health reasons, but also just energy independence. Because the more people that can get off of the grid, the less susceptible we are. We have very long supply lines and we have an infrastructure in this country that is very, very fragile. If we had more people that were taking care of themselves off the grid, growing their own food to somewhat, to some extent, 
That would be a great thing, but we have to have factories on the grid. We still have to have a grid. And unfortunately, with the current technologies of renewables, they are a very, very long way from being able to work reliably on the grid. Just because there's not the kind of energy storage on that kind of a scale like you have on an individual home. In an individual home, you can get the batteries to hold the power and to even out the supply and demand. You can't do that on the grid. Wind power as well as solar power are just too variable, especially wind power. But Obama and his people are more in love with nuclear. They like to talk about renewables, but what they're really in love with is nuclear, which I think is probably the most dangerous, the most threatening of all sources of power. None of them are perfect, but this is without a doubt the most dangerous. And we just saw that this last week. Look at Fukushima. Two and a half years into this, and they're still, as a, as a typhoon came by this, this last week, they had to release into the ocean 1,100 tons, not 1,100 gallons, 1,100 tons of radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. But as many scientists have pointed out, that's not really where the big risk is with Fukushima. They have a lot of spent fuel nuclear rods, a lot of rods that are in these reactors that were damaged, and those rods have to be taken out. If something happens with those rods, they're stored right now 100 feet above ground, and they have to be kept cool. And if that cooling fails, or if they have an earthquake like we also had this week in Japan, if they have an earthquake that is strong enough to topple those damaged buildings, if those spent nuclear rods touch each other, you will have a chain reaction. There's 11,000 nearly, it's 10,893 spent fuel assemblies are sitting in pools and they're vulnerable to these kind of earthquakes. And as scientists have pointed out, that's 85 times more long-lived radioactivity than was released at Chernobyl. If this were to happen, this would be something that would be far more damaging than the damage that we currently have been seeing. We've been seeing all kinds of damage in the sea from radio, radioactive, uh, radioactive material released into the sea. If this were to happen, if we had this kind of explosion, this would have catastrophic impact for the entire northern hemisphere. And all it takes is for these rods to touch each other. So they have a very touchy operation ahead of them to try to take this down, to try to remove these rods one at a time. They've got to do that perfectly without any of these things touching each other. And remember, there's been severe damage to that building. So these rods are not necessarily straight. They might be bent. They've got to pull these rods out without touching each other, or they're going to have a massive explosion. And this is something that's been going on for two and a half years. And we have other places in the United States where we have exactly the same type of technology. We had the former head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission just this last summer saying that in his opinion, we ought to shut down all of the nuclear power plants because they share this same danger that the Fukushima power plant shares. And that is having to try to keep this spent fuel cooled under all circumstances. It's a bad design. There are other designs, but unfortunately, it's a design that all of our nuclear power plants share. And we have several of them that are sitting on fault lines in the United States. And we even have places in uh, North Carolina, which, where I'm from, uh, the Sharon Harris Nuclear Power Plant just outside of Raleigh, has one of the largest fuel storage pools anywhere in the United States. They accept nuclear waste from a lot of other nuclear power plants, and they store it there. That is something that, as we've seen with Fukushima, it's not just a catastrophic failure of reactor like we saw with Three Mile Island or with Chernobyl, but it's also these fuel pools. But this is what Obama wants for us to save us from the imaginary carbon uh, threats. He's going to have nuclear power plants proliferate all over the United States. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with your calls. Well, welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex. Now, just before the break, we were talking about how Obama is trying to destroy coal, anything that generates carbon dioxide. And at the same time, he's pushing heavily for nuclear. We even see from a lot of Environmentalists, environmentalist activists that are with the Obama administration, they're even talking about how nuclear has less of a carbon footprint than even solar photovoltaics. Now, let's understand that photovoltaics don't represent the kind of health risk to the public that nuclear power does. And this whole thing about carbon is really not something that they should be able to sell anymore. I mean, really, the information is out there that it's not, we don't even have global warming going on anymore. Their models were bad. If we look at the data, 
the planet is actually cooling. We're actually seeing cooling now. Even when they thought it was warming, there was still a question as to whether it was man-made warming or whether it was something that was coming from the sun. Of course, the sun is a pretty major factor on our weather, don't you think? But their models didn't really take that into consideration. So they were projecting that the predominant factor was CO2. Now, that was a very convenient projection because that allowed them to set up some kind of a carbon exchange where we pay for the indulgence of using energy. Listen, if you're going to send off our jobs to China, if you're going to shut down our power plants, that's the way to conduct economic warfare on the United States. And that's precisely what this is. If you want to talk about danger, let's talk about nuclear power and the fact that we have highly radioactive fuel that has to be continuously cooled for hundreds or thousands of years. We have nuclear power plants that are now aging. They were designed to only last for 20 or 30 years. We're seeing leaks happening. We're seeing fires happening on a more frequent basis at places like Sharon Harris in North Carolina. And yet they just extend their licenses for another 20 years. Some of them, they've doubled the amount of time that the plant was to be up. So we have a concern about both the safety of reactors. We've seen in Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, many other places there can be a reactor failure. But as we've also seen with Fukushima, the fuel pools themselves can present a tremendous risk that will last for a very, very long time. And, you know, the government likes to tell us that there really isn't any risk. They said that about their nuclear weapons program. And we learned on Friday, the Guardian pointed out, that the U.S. nearly detonated an atomic bomb over North Carolina. We have a 1961 accident that was declassified. And it's kind of funny, the guy who wrote the report uh, said kind of harping back to Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, the subtitle was How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. This guy entitled his report, Goldsboro Revisited, or How I Learned to Mistrust the H-Bomb. What they had was a B-52 bomber that broke up in midair over North Carolina. Two nuclear bombs fell out and came very close to detonating. Only one low voltage switch prevented untold carnage. They said each bomb carried a payload of four megatons, the equivalent of four million tons of TNT, had the device detonated. Lethal fallout could have been deposited over Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, as far north as New York City, putting millions of lives at risk. And yet, the U.S. government has repeatedly denied that its nuclear arsenal has ever put Americans' lives in jeopardy through safety flaws. As this person points out, this would have been 260 times more powerful than the bomb that detonated over Hiroshima. And yet... With all the risks of nuclear power, without knowing what the true carbon... How do, you, how do you say that it has a lower carbon footprint than a photovoltaic when you have to cool these fuel rods for centuries? You have to guard the stuff for centuries. How can you say that it's got a smaller footprint when you've got to decommission and guard the power plant after a certain amount of time? It's a tremendously expensive form of of energy and it is extremely dangerous. The potential for catastrophic failure is extremely high of both the reactor itself and the fuel and yet this is what Obama wants to go to. Why? Because of this fantasy idea of CO2 being a problem. CO2 is what plants breathe. It's what trees breathe. And you know, marijuana takes it in even more so than trees. So just <laughs> plant some of that and get rid of the war on drugs. Actually, it's hemp. It's not just uh, marijuana. Hemp is not psychoactive. Let's go to some of the callers here. We've got Andrew in Philadelphia has been waiting for quite a while. Andrew, how are you doing? Hey. Uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, before I get into the real reason I called, just want to take five seconds to point out that since today is the fall equinox, it makes sense that the Illuminati would state something like the... Uh, mall shooting in Kenya today because they're obsessed with astrology. But the real reason yeah, I'm calling, uh, would you would you have a problem if I play the role of citizen whistleblower and expose some corruption on the part of a local police department? No, go ahead. Okay. I don't live in Cheltenham Township, Pennsylvania, but on the December 20th issue of the paper, uh, the township I live in, it talked about how the Cheltenham Township Police Department was going to change the way they do their jobs because they believe the official story of the Sandy Hook shooting. I went to the Cheltenham Police Department to try to explain to them that they have been had because they've fallen for a lie because it was staged by the government. And after I said that, the clerk at the front desk said, well, we're going to go along with the lie. That's all I have to say to you. Have a nice day. And then he turned around and left. And that was a huge sucker punch to the gut for me. And that's why I decided to call into the show to play the role of whistleblower. And I hope that encourages other people in America to also play the role of citizen whistleblower. Wow, that's amazing. 
Yeah, it, they don't necessarily have to believe it. They just have to be able to use it, right? That's really what yeah. they're after. They're looking, they're looking for excuses to put their policies in place. And so when you look at these shootings, even when we have very telltale signs, like we see a, a drill going on at the same time, or we see SWAT teams that are told to stand down, or we see somebody who's been complaining about mind control techniques that have been talked about for decades, nothing that is anything new about that. When we see those types of telltale things, it makes us concerned about that. But even if they didn't do that, even if they didn't do that, they're still using this to push their gun control agenda. You know, we had an article from The Guardian that was very disturbing because this guy was essentially, uh, it was by Henry Porter, The Guardian. He says, American gun use is out of control. Shouldn't the world intervene? He said, this has reached the point where it's ceased to be a domestic issue and the world cannot stand idly by. I'm very disturbed when I see that because The Guardian has been so good at exposing the threats to civil liberty at exposing the criminal spying and surveillance that our government has been conducting against not only American citizens, but the entire world. They've been on the forefront of that. And they've been on the forefront of fighting this bogus war in Syria and so many other things. And yet, they fall into this classic left-right paradigm and come after the Second Amendment. They clearly don't understand that the Second Amendment is part of our checks and balances. It is the most important part of our checks and balances because it's something that belongs to the citizens. Like the free press, like the First Amendment, like trial by jury, and all of those things, all of those things are under attack by the same people. It's not a left-right thing. It's not a Democrat-Republican thing. You always see the Lindsey Grahams and the Dianne Feinsteins coming after both the Second Amendment wanting to turn the possession of guns into a privilege and then wanting to make journalism and free speech a government granted privilege and it's time that people on the left and the right really see the big picture here they really need to understand that it's the same authoritarians that are coming after them every time and not fall for that we'll be right back with more of your calls right after the break stay tuned welcome back to the alex jones show i'm david knight filling in for alex We've been talking about the shootings this week. We've been talking about how Obama and the corporate press are now using what happened at the Naval Shooting Yard as well as what's going on in Kenya. They're using that as a way to, as an, another way to step up the arms control here at home to take away arms from citizens. At the same time, he wants to, and did this week, waive the ban on arming terrorists. So Obama has waived the ban on giving arms to terrorists, but now he's calling for a ban on American citizens having arms. We want to, got some calls here we want to talk to. We've got uh, Danny in Tennessee calling about psych meds. That's something they're not talking about, is it, Danny? Hey, can you hear me okay, David? Can hear you fine. Go ahead. Hey, David. Uh, I think you do a great job for Alex. You're, you're awesome. Oh, thank you. Um, no, I was going to say, <clears throat> I've been uh, on a lot of the psych meds and stuff before, um, different medications, and I just want to encourage everyone, if you have any fa friends or family that's on these, uh, you need to, um, you know, look out for them and, uh, you know, just, uh, <clears throat> what I was going to say was basically the experience I had, you know, it was a near-death experience, and uh, if it hadn't have been for... For you guys at Infowars and Alex and stuff, and uh, all that you know, y'all expose about what these things really do to our bodies. I'd probably still be on a lot of those meds. And um, that's good to hear. Y'all for all y'all do, David. But um, like I said, you know, if, if y'all have any friends or family that's on these medications, just you know, we need to support them and uh, you know, watch out for them. Uh, it's just like a lot of times the conversations I've had, even with like my doctors and stuff, they don't know what these meds are doing inside our bodies. They just know it helps with this disorder or that disorder. They don't really know what, oh, yeah. what these medications are actually doing inside our bodies. And they pile one on top of the other. And this is, of course, the thing that is the common thread in all these shootings. Whether or not it's got any suspicious things that make it look like a government false flag or that the government was involved in any way whatsoever, they all have, all of them, have the common thread of these drugs that they give people, these SSRIs, and yet, you don't hear any of that from the corporate media. It's amazing how silent they are. But it all makes sense if you look at it, because their major sponsor is these or these same drug companies. Uh, let's go to uh, Alex in Chicago. Alex, you wanted to uh, talk about MK Ultra? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. Happy uh, fall equinox. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I had a buddy actually uh, who was at a party over the summer festival, and he um, was partying too hard. Let's put it that way, and he started believing that he was being targeted for uh, MK Ultra recruitment to do a mass shooting or uh, a bombing of sorts. And you know, we tried to calm him down. Then the party ended, and the weekend ended, <clears throat> and he. Uh, Went about a week, and he continued getting paranoid, and he ended up trying to slit his femoral artery in his leg, mm. then uh, slit his wrist open, and uh, he was able to be uh, rescued by his mother's boyfriend, <clears throat> so he's okay now, but now they're loading him up with these SSRIs. Oh, yeah, that should help. Since then, yeah, right. Uh, I've talked to him since then, and he's still... Um, on edge and concerned that he's being not only part of this MK Ultra thing, but also like a religious type of deal. Mm. Um, so it's kind of an interesting type of event. Granted, I was with him the entire time and did see uh, suspicious things, such as you well, know, as a doctor, that looked like they were part of Craft International and such. Wow. Well, as the doctor that was here said, it, it's what's unusual. It's when it's a late onset in life, that it's sudden, that it's a sudden switch. They feel like they're being harassed. Uh, a schizophrenic, which is typically only about 1% of the population is schizophrenic, they will feel like they're getting talked to by God or by Satan or by some supernatural person. Typically, as he pointed out, this is something that's a, an immediate onset. It's much later in life than a schizophrenic, and they believe that they're being harassed. And that's not to say that, that that's necessarily sufficient to say that it's a technological assault as opposed to a real schizophrenic assault. But when they give them SSRIs, that's really just like pouring gasoline on the on a fire. Uh, it's a very, very dangerous thing. As we pointed out before, nobody is talking about that. Let's go to uh, Will in Arizona. Will, how you doing? I'm good, uh, David. Thank you. Um, uh, my conversation is twofold. One has to do with um, the article that came out regarding Obama waves and I terrorism provision yes. to arm Syrian rebels. Uh, and in that, you'll notice that uh, they use the Arms Export Control Act, and it says that uh, the U.S. Uh, president to waive provision in Section 40 and 40A, which forbid uh, providing, uh, what is that, munitions, credit, and licenses to countries. Countries. Right, countries. Point uh -huh. on that. Countries mm -hmm. supporting acts of terrorism. Yes, good point. Now, the point that I want to make is the Arms Export Control Act is under Title 22 U.S.C. Okay, chapter 39. And within that legislation located at subchapter 3, which is the front matter, and under Section 2780, under subsection D, it states, countries covered by prohibition. The prohibitions contained in this section apply with respect to a country. If yes. the Secretary of State determines that the government of that country has repeatedly provided support for acts of international terrorism. Now, I submit to you that that waiver is invalid if they're using that provision because it only allows for a structured government issue, not the citizens within or a rebellion within that country. And the other issue I wanted to bring up was uh, regarding um, Title uh, 18 United States Code under uh, Part 1, Chapter 113B, Section 2339B, which is providing material support or resources to designated foreign terrorist organizations. Prohibited activities, subsection 1, unlawful conduct, whoever, knowingly, not whoever other than the president or his cabinet. Absolutely. Says whoever, yeah. whoever knowingly provides material support or resources to a foreign terrorist organization or attempts or conspires to do so shall be fined under this title or in prison not more than 15 years or both. And if the death of any person results, shall be in prison for any term of years or for life. To violate this paragraph, a person must have knowledge that the organization is a designated terrorist organization. Now, get this. The Secretary of State makes a list in the United States. If you go to the United Nations and you look at the terrorist list, two of the uh, uh, organizations that have been identified as working with the, uh, the, the civil unrest in Syria is um, the, what is that, the Islamic State of uh, Iraq or something like mm -hmm. that. And there's another one, al-Nusra, 
Now, if you go to the Secretary of State's website and you look at the list that hasn't been updated since 2012, <laughs> you're <laughs> going to notice that those two those two are conspicuously absent. Now, I submit that it's that they're conspiring not only to omit yeah. those terrorist organizations from the Secretary of State's website, but they're in con- they're in contradiction to what the United Nations says are terrorist organizations. And they are guilty without question of providing material support or resources to designated foreign terrorist organizations. Well, I, I, guess a, I guess the que- you've made a good legal point there, Will, and I guess the question that we all have is how many times does the administration have to violate the law before something happens to them? I mean, look at how many different times. Look at the crimes that we already know about with the IRS going after different political groups, using the IRS as a weapon. That was one of the articles of impeachment against Richard Nixon. I mean, we've seen everything done in a large extent, far beyond anything that ever was required to impeach Nixon. Look at just the assassination of American citizens abroad with drone strike without trial, without due process, over and over again, passing laws that say they're going to indefinitely detain people without trial. I mean, it's amazing the criminal activity that this administration gets away with and continues to get away with. And as you point out, they're going to now arm terrorists. Everybody knows they're terrorists. It's a, la- it's a joke when, when they say they're not terrorists, when they say it's a small percentage. It was Jane's defensely, uh, defense that pointed out that the at least half of the the rebel soldiers in Syria are Al Qaeda, but Kerry insists that it's a very small minority. John McCain insists it's a very small minority. Putin laughed, and the world is laughing at him. It's just not credible, and yet they continue to do it and get away with it. We've got just a few seconds. Uh, Buzz in Delaware, can you tell us real quickly before the break uh, what you're calling about? Yeah, hi. Am I on? Yes, you're on. Just a couple. You got about 20 seconds. All right, I just wanted to bring up the fact that uh, the people that died from the shooting in D.C. were members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Provost Marshals. Mm. They were on their way, supposedly, to uh, arrest Obama for a false flag nuclear attack on D.C. So I think that's just something people should look into. Thanks. Yes, yes, thanks for bringing that up. You can look that up on the web. I've also seen that accusation. Don't know what's in it, but I've seen people say they were on their way to impeach Obama, some of the people who got killed. That's why that attack happened there. I don't know. We'll look into that further. That's it for today's broadcast. Alex will be back tomorrow at 11 a.m., 12 Eastern.